What is left to say that hasn't already been said about perhaps one of the most common military surplus rifles in the world? I mean, whatever, they keep making new Spider-Man movies like every month, so I can review an SKS in 2020. What is up guys, my name is John with PewPewTactical.com, your definitive source for gun reviews, gear guides, and communist rifle Jenga. Some of you probably already know that I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to military surplus rifles, and I'm always super stoked anytime I get a chance to cover guns with a bit of character and patina. So it worked out great that Palmetto State Armory just happened to import what I imagine is probably a shipping container full of Type 56 carbines, which is essentially the Chinese clone of Simonov's legendary SKS. Apparently directly traceable to China's Jianxi 26 small arms factory and quote, stored in a neutral country for 20 years which allows them to be imported, PSA themselves have stated that the guns run the gamut condition wise. A few even feature personalized artwork carved into the wood by their previous owners. So each purchase is basically like gambling for Fortnite skins in real life or whatever. Of course, considering these rifles have been sitting in storage for a few decades, they are going to be oozing with Cosmoline when they arrive at your doorstep. And if you have never tackled a Cosmoline cleaning job before, you can check out our guide on how we did that with these very rifles here. The original Russian SKS was developed by Sergei Simonov and was designed to take advantage of the Soviets' adoption of the M43 762 by 39 intermediate cartridge much less powerful than the 54R fielded by infantrymen and machine gunners, but a significant step up from the pistol calibers found in Soviet submachine guns. Allegedly, the SKS saw some very limited or experimental use with Russian frontline units near the end of the war in 1945, but not in any kind of significant numbers. Although it was ultimately replaced by Kalashnikov's OG AK-47, the SKS became quite popular with a number of Soviet satellite states as the Soviet Union exported the technical know-how, and in some cases the parts themselves, to communist militaries the world over. The Chinese themselves would go on to produce millions of Type 56 carbines, which is exactly where the three you see in front of you come from. From front to back, you've got your hooded front sight and barrel with no muzzle device, an underfolding spike type bayonet that's essentially a long flathead screwdriver that will still absolutely murder your gooey bits, your gas tube and handguard assembly, the rear sight block, your bolt assembly, trigger assembly, and the stock itself. While we have no real way to confirm this, all of the SKSs that we received, we suspect are kind of more on the beat to shit side of the spectrum, but that's honestly rad as hell if you're grabbing them more for the neat historical value rather than to create some sort of fucked up hunting Bubba carbine out of them, but you can do that too, also. Also, we're, we're gonna do that too. Ergonomics wise, the first thing that you're going to likely notice when handling an SKS for the first time is just how dated the design feels. I mean, yeah, no shit, right? It's a 75 year old design, but if you're mostly used to firing guns produced within the latter half of the past century, I think you'll know what I mean. For me, what probably stands out the most uh, when firing an SKS is what feels like a very bizarre length of pull. And I get that this is subjective. The uh, best length of pull for everyone is obviously going to be very different depending on the length of your arms and a variety of other factors. But with the SKS, it feels like the stock is just a little bit too short for the three feet of gun that you have hanging off of the front end. Um, these are not super light rifles. They're about eight and a half pounds or so unloaded. Um, so it's not really a huge weight issue, but it just feels very clunky when you've got this entire thing here and you got it real jammed into your shoulder like a weird rat person. It's a pretty minor gripe and it's obviously not something that is going to really get in the way of using the rifle itself, but I have to imagine that if you were on the lankier side in terms of Soviet conscripts, probably wasn't the most fun gun to use. The 10 round internal magazine can be fed through stripper clips or individually, but you'll likely need to play around with whatever clips you've got to ensure that they actually work with your rifle, considering the huge amount of tiny variances that can occur with all of the different countries that were producing SKS accessories. SKSX accessories? We actually snagged some new production SKS stripper clips and ran into all of the issues that 
SKS users on the internet have been maneuvering around for years. Namely, that some of them don't fit into the notch in the bolt. You might need to file or take a little bit of this paint or finish off. Some of them are a little bit too tight and wouldn't actually allow you to ram the rounds down into the magazine itself. Some of them were too loose and the rounds just kind of fell off in the Tricom chest rig that we've got here. Just be aware, they are not huge issues. They're annoying more than anything else, but they are pretty easily solvable. There's definitely a bit of a learning curve to using stripper clips, especially if you're going to be drawing them out of a period SKS Chicom rig with the absolutely abysmal wooden toggle closure systems. But I also realize how dumb it sounds to be retroactively critiquing Pearl Kit, considering the immense amount of armed conflict both the SKS and likely the gear issued with it have seen worldwide. Out to the range. It should be noted that given the state of the rifles, we didn't really bother shooting groups as that's probably not why anyone's bothering to snag an ancient commie gun. We were primarily focused on function and we were stoked when both rifles we took with us to the desert fit and fired just fine, stripper clip struggles aside. We did observe, however, that one of the rifles was hitting significantly above its iron sights, although that probably just has to do with the sights needing to be adjusted after sitting in storage for so long, but it could be that there's also some cosmoline still locked inside the barrel itself. What the fuck? As mentioned in the cleaning video, there's so much grease and gunk locked up inside these guns from sitting in storage for so long that despite your best efforts cleaning them, usually when you get them out to the range for the first time and start firing them, obviously they are going to heat up and that cosmoline is going to leak out from places that you didn't even know cosmoline could go. Regardless, both of them were reasonably minute of bad guy accurate out to about 150 or 200 or so yards, which is kind of where our local shooting spot tops out. So sure, you could eke a little bit more accuracy out of them if you really thoroughly cleaned all of that gunk out, but eh. The rifle's safety is located just above the trigger guard and a quick flick of the firing finger can switch the rifle on and off safe pretty quick, something the AK series of rifles lacks even today on modern variants. In terms of actual operation, they function just fine and are about what you'd expect considering the territory you're in. Recoil is obviously going to be a bit sharper than your standard AR-15, thanks to that chunky ass 7.62x39 cartridge. And the lack of a muzzle device means that most of the impulse is going to be straight upwards, meaning you'll need to get comfortable with mitigating that climb and keeping your irons on target if you're firing quickly. I also found that I just kind of naturally wanted to punch my support hand out real far and drive it forward like you would with an AR, dumb habits, to get a little bit more control over the rifle considering what feels like that really short length of pull to me, but doing so just blocks your iron sights entirely. So you can't do that, rip. The Type 56 is actually a super fun plinker if you're at all into military surplus rifles that you won't actually have to feel bad about firing. Considering the shape that PSA is selling them in, they're kind of very firmly in the, hey, this thing is pretty neat category. I'd even go so far as to say that they're great project guns if you're looking for a platform that will get you comfortable with cleaning disgusting grease out of every conceivable nook and cranny, even if your end goal is to sacrifice the desecrated remains of a once proud communist rifle upon the altar of TAPCO or FAB Defense. All right, guys, that's gonna do it for us today. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the content, just go ahead and subscribe to the channel and subscribe to the channel as there is lots more on the way. Also, we have shirts. We have a new web store. You can find that link right down below. Check them out. The designs are cool. The designs are fun and you will buy them. Once again, my name is John with Pew Pew Tactical. We will see you next time.